All right, we are live with another episode. On today's episode, I interview a mindset and life coach who helps procrastinators get shit done and live life on their own terms. From an unsatisfied musical theater actor living in New York to quitting the industry and signing up for professional development that emptied his bank account to zero, he was a nomadic coach for two years, traveling across America, visiting national parks. He's now based in Bend, Oregon, helping people create a life of freedom themselves. Welcome to the Winter Circle, Ben Walker. Honored to be here, Derek. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you on. We connected in Austin, Texas through our Onnit education at the Onnit Academy, and it's nice to have you on and chat and catch up. You've been up to, up to such amazing things, and uh, I can't wait to share that with everyone listening and no doubt we're going to be inspired myself included i like this is a very like positive podcast very positive conversations with the goal to uplift inspire and empower everyone listening along and the first question really sets us up on this positive good vibe and that is ben walker what do you love about your world right now not about the external world but your personal world oh wow what what i my my personal world right now <clears throat> this moment is it's uh what's the word it's a lot of a lot of things i've been working on and 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 wanting to accomplish and it's all coming to a head right now where like i'm hitting my stride in my business i'm hitting my stride in the in my my rock climbing which is very important to me i've like have a i've got a community that my partner and I have helped uh, helped each other and everyone else create like a lo local tribe and like life is fun. Everything about my life is fun right now. And that's the point. I have, I have this sticker on my water bottle that I, I put up everywhere. Fun is the point. And <laughs> yeah. it's, and, and it's been a ride, man. It's like the entrepreneurial game is like you got to ride those waves and when you're when you're in the dip you have to know like yeah this sucks but i know that wave is coming uh -huh, uh -huh. and it's been I've, I've ridden them and ridden them and like i'm on the crest of a wave and i've been on the crest of a wave most of this year and uh yeah like being being able to see everything that i've worked on uh and actually applying it like applying it in my business applying it with my clients and seeing the results both for myself and them is has been super rewarding and uh yeah like that that's what i'm most excited about mm -hmm. right now is like i'm doing the damn thing and it's working <laughs> you are doing that damn thing i can feel it i can feel it um another question i like to ask everyone here uh when we get things started so that we can better the audience and myself can better know you is what is your mission not only the mission in your business but the mission in everything that you do okay this is great so by december 13th 2072 i am the oldest person to free climb the nose of el capitan Ooh. that's with rope by the way that means uh, I, yeah. I do have a rope yeah that that's my mission and mm -hmm. and everything else like the coaching my my relationship my friends all of that is part of this goal of of climbing el cap wow i love that i've never heard anyone state their mission like that like a end goal something that they're working towards and i feel that's really powerful oh yeah it's i set this goal um right right before when was it the like 2021 was when when I, I came up with this goal because I'd always I've always been the person who's like, I want to be that really old guy who when you're hiking, he just blows right past you. And is like, oh, yeah, I'm just out for a stroll. And like, meanwhile, you, you're like about to die. And that old guy just like walks right past you on the mountain. I've always wanted to be that guy. And yeah. I knew, you know, as a coach, I know how important it is to have your goal that you're working towards be as specific as possible. And I know that like, enjoy running around in the mountains for my whole life. 
Like that's close, but I knew it could be more specific. And one day I was, I was just out walking my dog and I was like, ah, oldest person to climb El Cap. That's it. Cause I think about like, what, like what would be like the most badass thing that I could do with my body at 80 years old? Cause uh-huh. that's December 13th, 2072 is my 80th birthday. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I realized that like looking at a goal like that, everything else about my life needs to be aligned for that to happen. Like I need to have a business that supports me disconnecting and spending two months in Yosemite, like working on that, that route. Cause it's, it's 3000 feet tall. So it's yeah. going to take some time to like, to figure out the best way to, for me to do it. And like, I need to have a business that supports that. Uh, I need to have a, like a relationship with my partner that supports that. Um, ideally my, my, my ultimate goal is one of my kids or my grandkids belays me. So in like thinking about, you know, having my kids like rock climbing, I don't know if they will, but I know that forcing them to do it because it's what I want to do is going to make them hate it. So like, I think about that. And then it's also, um, part of that goal too, is it's because the, because that's an important word because I lived my highest standard of health. So when I like right before this podcast, I got set up, I've got a red light right here. I got set up here in my office and I did my whole joint warm up. Uh even though I it's smoky outside and I might not do anything athletic today, but that warm up is what my 80 year old self would want me to do. Heck yeah. So when I'm thinking about all of my health choices, it's not just, you know, I want to, you know, lift this much weight 12 weeks from now. It's, I want to climb. I want to be rock climbing at a high level when I'm 80. So What's the thing where, cause you know, you've always heard like someone in their forties or fifties and like, ah, yeah, I've got a bum knee. Could have taken care of it in my thirties, but I didn't do it. Like how everyone knows someone with one of those yeah. injuries. Yeah. And so I thought, well, what if I did all the things that those people re- wish they had done? And like, I, I see, I see the results. Like I, there's so many people who like, they'll just see me doing my joint warm up and they're like, Oh wow, I should really do that. I bet it would help me with all these pains that I have in my body. I'm like, yeah, it would. It takes five minutes. Uh huh. Why don't they, from what you've learned about procrastination, which is the big thing of yours, why aren't people doing this? Yeah. It's um, honestly, a lot of it is uh, there's, there's more important stuff to do. It's like, Oh, I gotta, well, I gotta get this, this busy work done. Like, Oh, so-and-so needs my help. I gotta go help them first. So it's always this distraction of, uh, busy work and helping other people. And it's just pouring out of your own cup, pouring out of your own cup. And there's never the time to pour back in. And Uh. that's where like a lot, a lot of the people I've worked with, it's, um, like they, and it's, 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 you know, it's a double-edged sword because it's okay to like have a lot of like value and get a lot of validation from, you know, being the dependable one who people can count on. I mean, I'm often that person as well. And that like, there comes a point of diminishing returns where you're burning yourself out, helping everyone else. And there's never any energy for your own pursuit, your own Mm self-care. And then, you know, we get into the, like, I'm not good enough kind of stories where we're like, someone believes like, Oh, I, I, I'm not good enough to take care of myself. I have to like earn that by taking care of everyone else first or, Mm -hmm. or taking care of this thing in my business first. And that just means like the self-care stuff just gets put off and put off and put off and put off. And it's, it's really most of the time comes from, oh, I need to help everyone else first. Uh, uh, and your goal as a coach is to help people with this. It's, it's teaching others how to live life on their own terms. And let's uh, rewind and let's get back to the origin story on what brought you to your position where you're in now. Um, 
as a mentor for many and a lifestyle and mindset coach. And we could go back as far as back as you want to trace this journey. Yeah. Well, I mean, it started with, I, I was a musical theater actor. I was studying, I went to college for it. Um, and my first gig was I went on a national tour. I was on in beauty and the beast for two years touring North America. And on that time, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll use all this time I've got sitting on the bus to get certified as a personal trainer. That'll be a great side gig. Yeah. Wrong. It's not oh. a good side gig. <laughs> yeah. Being a personal trainer is a terrible side gig, especially if you're, if you're an actor where it's also unpredictable. Yeah. Um, and I eventually, I, uh, I started noticing that all of my free time was spent learning about the steel maze like we met on a steel at a steel maze certification so like auto, yeah. i knew like automatically we're tribe uh yeah. but like all of my energy was focused on that i was learning about that reaching out to people about that how do i find a way to like teach more people this and auditioning for shows became just trying to get a job yeah. i was looking at like what you know oh does this show is a role for a mid-20s white guy i'll audition for that and I didn't actually care about any of the shows. And I, I ended up booking this, this four month string of work, which for a musical theater actor is, is stellar. Like usually you're lucky if you get four weeks uh -huh. and I got four months in a row at really great theaters. And I thought, Oh, well that, oh, cause I was on the verge of leaving already. I was like, Oh, well maybe this is the sign. Like I'm working at one of the best regional theaters in the country. I'll, I'll, I'll keep going. And then it was, it was like frustrating and unfulfilling. We weren't treated well. The shows weren't good. And I thought, and I was, I was completely unfulfilled artistically. And I was like, this is not why I work so hard to do this bullshit. So that, and that was, and I was, I remember I was like closing this last show and I wanted to pull my hair out thinking about going back to New York city and doing this audition grind again. And that's when uh, Mike Bledsoe was launching the Strong Coach. Uh -huh. And I, I knew this was something I wanted to do. And before, before I even like, got on a discovery call for it, I knew it would cost as much money as I had. And I was uh -huh. freaking out about it. Uh -huh. And uh, I cried to my parents, cried to my girlfriend. And then I got on the call and I was like, you know what? This is the thing I need to do. And it was exactly how much money I had in my bank account. And it was the best, best money I ever spent. Uh -huh. And that got me on the, on a completely different track where then through that program, I, I started getting clients and I was booked up and I was able to support myself completely from my coaching business. And I was like, Oh, I can travel now. I can finally have this life. But every time I talked about it, uh, tension would rise with my partner uh -huh. because she saw every, every change that I was excited about as me taking a step further away from her and the yeah. relationship. And she was right because <laughs> like, like deep down, I knew we're going in different directions, uh -huh. but I, I was too afraid to do what, what needed to happen. Uh -huh. And I kept, I kept putting off. I knew that's the classic thing with procrastination is, you know what you should be doing. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the thing I knew. Yeah. This is not working out, but I had, I really strongly identified with being the nice guy, uh -huh. you know, being that like, Oh, you're such a, you're so safe. Like you're, you're not an asshole. Like all the other guys have dated. And I wanted to keep that persona. Uh -huh. And I, I imagined if I broke up with her, then I would just be another one of those douchebag guys that she dated. Yeah. And I'd, I'd hurt her. I'd, I, you know, I'd have ruined my reputation, all these things. Uh -huh. So I was trying to hold on to this relationship that I knew wasn't working really just to yeah. save face. Yeah. And it took, uh, like I, I flew across the country to go to this retreat in California that was designed to like, get to that like when you when you know like i don't know what's wrong but something isn't right yeah. something's not right in my life and it was there to like figure it out i was like yeah. oh this is i'm gonna figure out like what's blocking me from being the perfect boyfriend 
Uh-huh. And what ended up happening was I remember we came out of a particularly uh, emotional coaching session, you know, I cried a whole bunch, a whole bunch of tears about something. I don't even remember what it was. And the, the coach is like, we're going to integrate it now. And the coach is like, okay, well, we've been having this conversation about your girlfriend and went, oh yeah, we need to break up. It was so clear. Yeah. And uh, I, and I realized that like the best partner I could be in that moment is an honest one. Yeah. So I called her and, and we broke up right then and there. And, you know, obviously she wasn't happy uh-huh. about it, but as soon as it was done, I immediately felt lighter. Uh huh. And we even talked later and she, even, she talked about all the ways that she'd been settling in the relationship. Uh-huh. And I was like, all right, this is the right decision for both of us. Yeah. And that, that then catapulted me forward when I find I had the freedom that I'd been seeking yeah. to go to travel and live nomadically, like work from anywhere. Yeah. And, and then COVID hit and it was, it was honestly perfect timing. I ended up spending the first two months of quarantine uh, with, in a ranch with a view of Zion national park in Utah, oh, wow. my back window. That's incredible. And oh my God, it was, it was amazing. Like I won quarantine. If there was, if how there did, was a competition, <laughs> how did you get there? How did you get that position on that ranch? So I was in, I was in San Diego. Um, and this is when I was working for the strong coach and, uh, Mike Bledsoe kicks down my door and he's like, yo, I'm going to Utah in four hours. Are you coming? And I was like, what the fuck? And then the thing is I, I've been practicing, uh, a big list of mantras from that retreat. And one of them was I embrace uncertainty. And that was the first thing that popped into my head. Uh And I thought, all right, we're going. So we drove through the night. It was like the beginning of a Stephen King novel. We drove through the night to the, to, to Utah. Didn't even know we were going to, where we were going to stay. We camped the first night just in some random, random BLM land. Yeah. And then, uh, Mike found this ranch and we stayed there for a week. And then we like, Texted the the host and was like, "Hey, what's Airbnb giving you? Can we just pay you directly?" <laughs> and then we stayed th- we stayed there for two months, and then okay. we did a month in Tahoe after that. And then I drove from Tahoe to visit my family in Vermont, and then from there, I went everywhere, like down to Virginia, out to Colorado, up into Montana and Glacier National Park, back down into Utah, and I. I Probably I, a month was the longest I spent in one place uh-huh. traveling, traveling around. And I started like hiking mountains to get cell phone service to do my coaching calls. Yeah. Because I, I wanted to work from anywhere and I wanted to push that boundary uh-huh. of, uh-huh. of working from anywhere. And what it really, it culminated in, I I had this idea for a nomadic road trip called follow spring North because spring, it really, it first hits in the Southwest and then it slowly works its way North. So we started in Sedona, Arizona and over six months, we worked our way camping and Airbnb up to Washington. You and Mark? Uh, No, not me and Mark. It was, uh, so this, we, uh, Mike and I split off. uh, Mike, yeah. Yeah, went in different directions. But then I invited a bunch of my friends because my friends were like, oh my God, you're doing this nomad thing. It looks so cool. And I was like, yeah, come hang out. Come do it with me. Yeah. So I had like eight friends who joined me on this road trip. And we went all the way from Sedona to Gig Harbor, Washington, which is right by Seattle. Yeah. And uh, that whole time I, I told people, because people were like, oh, are you just going to do this thing forever? I was like, no, I'm location scouting. Yeah. And then we came through Bend. And Bend has every outdoor sport you can imagine. It's all within 45 minutes uh-huh. of the town. So I was like, this is the spot. So we ended up, as soon as we got to Gig Harbor, we found out that we got approved for a house in Bend. So we moved into the house. Then I went to Alaska for two weeks because that was the, the end of the trip for me was going to Alaska. That, and that yeah. was the trip of a lifetime. And then came back here to Bend and started up started coaching more and oh, that's wow. so that's that's been the ride 
Uh huh. What a ride! <laughs> and it's how long were you in New York? Because all these places you've been, these mountains, all this, all this nature is a far cry from like the concrete urban jungle that is New York. And yeah, I was well, in like, New York uh, off and on for three years. Okay, and how was that experience for you? Oh, it, it was rough, man. It really was. Uh, I found New York to be like really stressful. And like everything's inconvenient. Everyone's walking really fast and it's loud and it's smelly. And what, what I found is the kind of person who enjoys New York city, uh -huh. whenever I ask them, they're like, Oh, there's always something going on. You can go do this. You can go check out this restaurant. You can go do that. And like, if you're that kind of person, New York is great. Uh -huh. But if you want to like open your back door to a view and have greenery easily accessible oh yes please yeah new york is it's it's challenging to do that in new york uh, so yeah i remember there it got to the point where i would like the, the headphones that you wear at a, sh at a gun range i would yeah. wear those around the city oh it's because it's just quite the noise yeah we're like riding the subway all that stuff yeah it, it it's it's honestly it's it's a really unhealthy place to live uh. in my opinion like I remember when uh, like COVID was happening and I was, I would say like, well, I'm taking care of my health. I think I'll, I, I imagine I will be okay. And I remember like people saying like, Oh, but what about all these like young actors in New York? They're getting COVID. They're healthy. I was like, if they're living in New York, they are immunocompromised. No doubt. They're, yeah. they're, they're not at optimal health. If they're living in that environment, there's no way. Yeah. And that was really out of alignment for the person I was becoming. Because what really got me started on this journey was actually a, a, an Aubrey Marcus post where it oh. said, uh, the more you wake up to who you are, the more agonizing it becomes to be who you're not. And I read that. I was like, oh, that's exactly what I'm experiencing right now because I'm in this relationship that's not for me anymore. I'm in this career that's not for me anymore. I'm living in this city that's not for me anymore. And it's driving me nuts. Yeah. And I, I knew I had to take a leap and make a big shift in order to live the life that, that would be in alignment for me. Yeah, absolutely. Fear must have come up so many times um, on this journey, like from just draining your bank account um, to go on these professional developments, to leaving New York, to going on the road, to just embracing the uncertainty. So let's talk about fear and your relationship with it and what you've learned about fear on your travels and your journey thus far. What, what I've learned is often fear is the finger pointing you in the direction you should go. Uh -huh. There, like, I mean, especially in, in the realms of like personal development and working through, you know, old childhood traumas and patterns is I, I've bumped up against moments where like I have a choice that I can make and I can feel that like insecure child is like, no, I want to shy away from this. This is yeah. scary. I don't like it. It's unknown. Yeah. I don't know what's going to yeah. happen. I'm going to have to put myself out there. What are people going to say about me? Yeah. And I've learned that that feeling is the one that says, keep going. Uh -huh, like there's uh -huh. a resistance that says stop. And there's a resistance that says, keep going. And I actually, I remember I asked Mark England this when I was in the lifted cert and he was, he just, all he said was, you'll know. And I was like, oh, okay, I trust you. And eventually I did. I learned that like, I found that the resistance that says stop is usually it's more of a, like an anger type resistance. And the resistance that says, keep going is like sad and withdrawn. And whenever I feel that, I know, oh, I need to step forward into this because what I want is on the other side yeah. of this. And I, I've learned that like rock climbing has taught me so much about fear because uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, I've, I've taken some big falls. And the thing I've learned is the fear doesn't change. It's still there. What changes is how convincingly you can say, I've got this. Uh-huh. And that like that's the ultimate 
difference is I can be in a really precarious position rock climbing and to be able to tell myself I've got this. Even when like that, the animal part of my brain is like, you're going to fall and die. It's like I'm on a rope. I've got this and then make the move. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is that, that the metaphorical rope is still, is still there. Like uh, most people, you know, in the, in the personal development space, I hear a lot of people talk about safety, priming safety. Yeah. Uh -huh. And what you hear, what often you hear people say is, I don't feel safe. I want to feel safe. But, yeah. you know, in, in, in the, the realm of language, I don't feel safe is a negation. It doesn't tell us what is happening. It tells us what's not happening. Yeah. So if you don't feel safe, what's the opposite of safe? Uh, the opposite of safe would be danger. Exactly. So then, because the thing is, you, you're not recognizing. If you say, oh, I don't feel safe, I don't feel safe. What you do imagine is that you're in danger. But if you don't uh. say that, you just focus on the, the lack of safety that you're, that you're imagining. And then you can yeah. go, okay, am I in danger? Is my life in danger right now? Uh -huh. Nine times yeah. out of 10, it's not. No, no, no. So let's let's like um, use an you you as an example here. Um, in when you brought your bank account to zero, because like that's like that's a fear of mine. That I think keeping me stuck where I am is like the fear of like selling my place, like I own my place, selling it, and just like investing all that money in myself. And the fear is like, oh, like I'm not going to, I'm going to lose all that. I'm going to go down to zero and then I'm going to be fucked. I'm going to be like a homeless old man. But e even then, like I'm sh I, I know I, I have faith that like I'd make that work. Um, but so let's examine, uh, yeah, like the fear you encountered of just emptying your savings, your life savings and literally having zero dollars mm -hmm. to your name. So something that that I, I'm really grateful for is, is my parents. Uh -huh. They, they nailed it as parents. And what, like when I called them, I don't, I wasn't even calling to ask for money. It was just like, Mom, ah! <laughs> you know? And uh, what they said is, Hey, look, we thought we imagined this would happen with you or your sister. You know, at some point you might need our help. So we've set aside money for like a bail the kids out fund. Yeah. So we, we support you uh -huh. in this uh -huh. and, and we'll help you until, until you get back on your feet. Uh -huh. So the, like the big thing for me there was being comfortable asking for that help and accepting uh -huh. that help. Cause uh -huh. I know a lot of people who even, even if they're offered it, will say, Oh no, no, I, I, I'll, I'll do it myself. Uh -huh. Instead of receiving the support that is being freely and lovingly given to you. Yeah. And I guarantee that if you lost your house, you have at least one friend who'd be like, oh my gosh, Derek. Yeah, dude, that sucks. Come crash on my couch for a bit until you get your feet, until you get back on your feet. Yeah. Everyone has at least one person who would be yeah. able to support them in that because because that's the thing is people go oh if i lose all my money i'll be alone and i'll have to live out on the street yeah but that's not going to happen yeah. if you can be humble enough and uh and vulnerable enough yeah. to ask for help uh-huh and that was the I thing is that having that support within uh, like three months, I was back to supporting myself completely, and yeah. I didn't need them to to send me money anymore. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I feel like the self limiting belief for me is like if I if I sell my place and invest in myself, like I I won't be able to get another place, and that's the self limiting belief. Like I don't know how I'm going to build up all this equity to buy a new house, um, but and that yeah, like how how would you advise your clients to push past those self living beliefs, such as the one I just yeah. uh, brought forth. So in, in that situation, um, one, we, we do a deep dive into, you know, 
what did you learn when you were five that uh-huh. taught you that if you fail, the world is going to end. No one's going to uh-huh. love you anymore. Everyone's going to ostracize you. Uh-huh. I figure out where, where did, where did that come from first? Okay. Uh, Cause then, then we'll be able to, to move forward through that. Um, uh-huh. The other part is it's, it's down to your belief in yourself to do the work. Uh-huh. Cause most of the, most of like, most things in entrepreneurism work the same way. Like I'm sure you know who Alex Hormozzi is. Yeah. His stuff works. If you've got a landscaping business, if you're a coach, if you own a bakery, all of that stuff still applies. Uh uh-huh. Like all of these business principles. So it's a simple matter of, okay, you've, you've taken this step will you believe in yourself to do the work? Because if you do the work and you do it well, you do get the result. Yeah. It's a matter of, can you sit in that uncomfortable moment? Yeah. Because people, you know, people want everything to flow with ease, but that doesn't just happen. Um, You know, the, like I liken it to rolling a boulder downhill. You want to get it going and it'll go. And it'll just roll and roll. And you don't have to do anything, but you got to give it a little oomph first. Yeah. And most yeah. people stop at that. Like, oh, this isn't it. This isn't easy. This isn't in my flow. I guess it's not for me. It's like, no, you have to do some work. Yeah, like the universe the isn't just going to manifest some shit for you while you're sitting on your couch, burning 100%. sage and saying saying mantras that don't actually mean anything to you. Yeah, the universe doesn't give a shit about that. The universe Action. is going to reward action it's 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 a relationship there yeah. it's not just going to do stuff for you uh, yeah i agree like a bringing together of the being the being it and the action of it and the melding of those two um you have a very big presence um on social media in today's climate is that a necessary a necessity necessity for an entrepreneur to be on social media to generate business. Um, it kind of seems like it is. Uh, I, I disagree. I do not okay. think it's a necessity. Okay. Um, it is one easy way uh-huh. to, to, to find customers. Uh-huh. And it can be very effective if you know how to do it. Yeah. But uh, you could... Like I, I, I made this joke to my friends. Like if I paid you $3,000, would uh-huh. you text 60 people right now about your services? Uh-huh. Like if you have, if you have a phone with contacts and you're an entrepreneur, you have leads yeah. right there. Yeah. You, you know, you have your personal network or even I'm, I'm learning that a lot of the people uh, that I work really well with and that, that respond best to my coaching, they're not super active on Instagram. Uh Because they're busy running their business. Yeah. So that's the thing is it's it's not about having to be on social media. It's about learning the people that I am best fit to serve. Where do they hang out? Uh Uh-huh. Are they using LinkedIn? Are they using Instagram? Are they in a a a business networking group? Or or is it, you know, just someone I'm gonna meet on the street? Yeah. Or is it doing in-person workshops at gyms? Yeah. You know, that's like that that's the thing is is social media is is like the most popular tool. Yeah. But it's not a one size fits all for every group. And there's people I've I've done like market research interviews with where I'm like, what's your Instagram handle? And they're like, oh, I don't do that. Uh-huh. Like Okay, so I, I'm not going to find this person on Instagram. Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying here. So, because I threw um, events, my first Welcome to the Winner Circle Presents event um, to kick off like the relaunch of this podcast after a summer hiatus. And I had a concert um, with two of my guests, um, former guests. And it was like a backyard concert, a party. And I put like the post on social media, and it was literally like crickets. There's like, no response and like what it took was for me to direct reach out to all my network and 
through that way, like then it, it took off and it was a success. Um, and I, I feel like that's what you're kind of talking about is like the, the reach out. Um, I was experienced resistant to doing that. Like I didn't want to like bother people or harass people. Let's talk about that. Um, oh but- yeah. <laughs> that's my, cause here's the thing. That's why I was procrastinating doing it. It's the same yeah. thing. I was like, Oh, I don't want to spend hours on Instagram trawling for clients just to slide yeah. in their DMS and try and sell them some shit. Yeah. 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 That, that was my resistance too. And, uh the only reason I was experiencing that resistance is because I wasn't doing it and I was imagining what it would be like if I did, but I was Um, trying to imagine that from no experience of uh, actually doing it, of starting 20 conversations a uh day. And when, uh, cause I, I like this, the, uh, the result of that procrastination was like my coaching business was flopping and I had to get two side jobs. Uh Uh-huh. So like what I was already doing, just like putting stuff out on social media and hoping people show up, that wasn't yeah. working. And that's what no. most entrepreneurs are doing is yeah. they think, oh, I just, I just post some stuff and the right people will get the message and then they'll show up. It's like, no, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. Because I, here's no. the thing. I imagine everyone here listening and, and you too, Derek, has had that moment where you're sitting on the couch and you're like, man, I wish someone would hit me up to do something right now. Uh-huh. And all of your friends are sitting on the couch thinking the same thing. I wish someone uh-huh. would hit me up to do something right now. And it takes that one person saying, Hey, let's go do something. Yeah. So I've, I've had, sure. you know, clients who, you know, they just like, like my post every now and then. And I message them. I'm like, Hey, thanks for liking my post. I really appreciate that. Cause I do. Yeah. You know, I put a lot of, of work into, into my content. Yeah. And often, you know, they're liking that post because they're experiencing the exact problem that I help people with. Yeah. So like through the conversation, it becomes clear like, Hey, you've got a thing. I can help you fix that thing. Do you want to get on a call so I can tell you about how I can help you fix that thing? Yeah. And it's like, they weren't gonna reach out to me on their own. Uh Uh-huh. So that's the thing in, in, in entrepreneurism now is most people are waiting for you to reach out because uh-huh. they're, for whatever reason, you know, like, honestly, if, if you're like a life coach, the people you want to work with probably ha- are too insecure to reach out to you. Yeah. So it's like, you have to be the one to go talk to them. And I found that when I finally did that, uh-huh. started 20 conversations a day. That is what got my business to finally take off. Uh-huh. That's when I'd, I'd open my phone and have 20 plus unread DMs on my Instagram from people who could uh, become my clients, people that I could help. And it was, it was easier than I thought. Uh, it, was, it was damn effective because um, I went from like two clients in January to 23 in July. Uh-huh. Simply, but and the main driver was starting conversations with people. That yeah. thing that I've been resisting, and again, it was easier, and than I thought it was. Took way less work than I thought it would, and I knew the open-hearted place that I was coming from. Uh-huh. I'm in this because when when I see someone procrastinating their potential away. Yeah. And they have all the, all the tools they need, but they keep distracting themselves with like meaningless, busy work. It's like, Oh my gosh, I, I want to help you do the thing. Yeah. I want to help you do it. So like, that's the energy I'm coming into all of these conversations with. So it's never sleazy. Uh -uh. No, I've even had people on sales calls. Like I get, you're trying to tell me, trying to sell me something, but I feel like you also care. Yeah. And I feel that that's the, that's the truth is like when I, when I get into a, a sales call with someone, it's a coaching call. My whole toolbox is, is at your disposal. And if you take what we work on, on that call and you apply it, you will get the result and you don't need me at all. Yeah. 
Um, another barrier I feel like a lot of your clients encounter is um, pricing themselves for what they're worth. And so let's talk about how you do that is like valuing your knowledge, your expertise, your service, and knowing that the right people will be willing to pay for that. And those that are unable to, well, then um, there's other options for them, I guess. But I, I feel like that's like a, a barrier a lot of entrepreneurs come up against is how to price their services and to ask for what they want, what they're worth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's the, the tricky part about pricing, especially uh, in the entrepreneur world, because like so many entrepreneurs, it's they get in, you're in it because of the passion, the love of uh, the craft. Yeah. And that's then the problem if you try to price yourself based off of what you're worth, is then your pricing and your product is about you. Uh -huh. So if someone says no to that, they're not just saying no to the product, they're saying no to you. They're saying uh -huh. you're not worth it. And yeah. that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> like if someone says that to you, that really sucks to hear. Yeah. So the, 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 the change that I made, and I, I learned this really early is pricing yourself is not about you. Your marketing is not about you. Your product's not about you. Your price is not about you. Uh -huh. It's all about them. Okay. So the way I, the way you price yourself is how valuable is this pro is this solution? that this person wants. So uh -huh. like for a while, and this is one of the things I tried that didn't work uh, from a marketing standpoint was I had a fitness program for dads. Yeah. I'm not a dad, even though it worked for the dads that I beta tested it with marketing wise, it didn't. Cause I didn't have a vulnerable story I could tell about being yeah. a dad. Yeah. But the, in pricing it, I wasn't selling a fitness program. I wasn't selling nutrition. I wasn't even selling accountability. I was selling crawl on the floor with your grandkids. Yeah. I was selling always be ready for dad come play with me. Uh huh. That is valuable. Uh huh. So, and like, I like thinking of even for me, when, when I wanted to sign up for the strong coach, in my mind, it wasn't just, oh, I want to learn some business stuff. It was, I want to travel and work from anywhere and have total freedom. Uh -huh. That was worth $5,000 for me. It was, so it wasn't about, it's not about the product. It's about the problem you're solving. So if you want to charge a thousand dollars a month for something, yeah, you need to find a problem that is worth a thousand dollars to someone to solve. Uh -huh. So then it's not about how valuable your service is. Uh huh. It's all about how, how valuable is this problem and this solution for somebody else? Like if you price yourself that way, it's going to be way easier to, to charge an amount that's actually going to support you Yeah. than it is if, you, if you're like, well, what am I worth? Because like, what's a human life worth with this imaginary currency that only exists because enough people believe in it? You know, uh. like- Money's a funny thing. It's like, hey, let's make the world run off of something that's completely imaginary. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, yeah, that's a great. Yeah. That's a great idea. <laughs> but that that's that's what I, I say whenever someone says like, ah, oh, how do I know what I'm worth? I want to charge what I'm worth. Is it's not about you. Yeah, it's about them. So find find the problem that is so valuable to them that they they will pay any price yeah. to solve that problem. And. Yeah. You know, I, I, and if someone, I'll, I'll be in a situation where someone is saying, like, ah, oh, it's just a lot of money. And I was like, okay, look, imagine you're, you're crushing, you're crushing it in your business. Yeah. It's totally supporting you. You got total time and, and, and financial freedom. You can travel wherever you want. Are you going to be thinking about how much money you paid me when you're there? Like, is it worth it to you? to pay this money if that is what you're going to get. Yeah. And because that's the thing too, is whenever, when I've experienced coaching, like I'm working with a coach right now on my business, signed yeah. up in January, and I've already 10 x my investment with him. Wow. So that's the thing is I have no qualms 
about, you know, about the money that I spent with this coach. Cause I've made it back 10 times since then. Yeah. And that's like, when you're in that situation, that's what, you, that's what you need to think of as, as a coach and an entrepreneur is you're not going to be thinking about like, like it's going to be worth it to you when you're sitting on the top of your mountain and you've achieved your thing. It's like, yeah, you're not going to think about a couple thousand bucks that you paid this coach to help you get there. 100%. So let's take a moment to acknowledge some of the helpers and mentors that have helped you to get you to where you are today. You mentioned a few. Um, so let's just name a few. I know there's tons, but just name a few that come to mind. Who were they and what were the key takeaways you learned from them that you've incorporated into your being? Oh, I love this question. Uh, so the, the first one is, uh, is Danny Rios, who he'd be a great guest on your pod on your show, by the way. Um, he, uh, when I, when I signed up for the strong coach, he was my coach and I did not know what I was in for. Uh, I thought I would just learn some coaching skills. And he, he was the one who really popped the hood on my head and showed me there's a different way to do things. And to like think of uh, think through the realm in the realm of uh, possibility, always uh, thinking in possibilities. And there's if, if if there was a Danny Rios meme, it'd be him, sunglasses, fedora, chilling on a beach with a big joint in his mouth. And he just takes a hit and he goes, "Dude, life, man!" <laughs> like that. He Amazing. he is he is the most open hearted person I have ever met. And he, he sherpaed me through so much. And it's like, what I would always hear him say is like, yeah, I trust in life and I trust in the process. And I watched that take him from being stuck owning a gym. He didn't want to own anymore to like moving back to Mexico. And now he's, uh, he guides mushroom ceremonies. He, he was my first mushroom experience too. And it, I could not think of as I trust him with my life. Absolutely. Uh -huh. So yeah, he, he was, he was the one who really helped me uh, with, have the confidence to, to make those big leaps. Like because of, because of the guidance that, that he gave me and things he instilled in me of, again, always being open to, possibilities it's never just this one way it doesn't have to be this way uh -huh. think of it like he would he would say like you know this is a really simple way if you want to like hack your personal development is when you're in a situation think what would i usually do okay i'll do the opposite mm -hmm. that that's what he told me and i was like that's so simple and it works i've seen yeah. it happen like i've even done it was like would i usually put my right shoe on first i'll put my left shoe on first Shit's different when you do that. <laughs> so that's, that's when he, he's been a huge influence for me. Um, and then other mentors, I mean, Mike Bledsoe and Mark England, both uh, guys who, who I've, uh, who I've worked with. And, uh, you know, honestly, here, here's the thing. What I've, what I've, what I'm piecing together now. I, oh, this is such a great question, Derek. Um, they are all guys who, you know, surface level, you might think, oh, they're up there. Like, like there was, I, I, I had like problems uh, being open enough to connect like with, with Mike because I had him on like the Mike Bledsoe barbell shrug pedestal. Uh -huh. And then I was in a house with him for two months where all we could do was work and then smoke a joint and run around on the trails. That was all we did for two months. Yeah. And like, I saw him like the actual human being that he was and how open hearted and generous he is. And I was able to like take him off the pedestal and like, he's my buddy, Mike. Now we're like, even to the point where like he fired me last year and it was like, he's still my buddy, Mike. I still love him. And like, I can still hit him up, whatever. And just be like, Hey, I have a question or, Hey, what's going on? And like, there's no hard feelings about it at all. Uh -huh. And Mark is the exact same way. He, he comes off with like this big, like, ah, pirate, 
word magic, all of this stuff. And again, such a beautifully open hearted, generous man. And like, I, that's what I bring into my, my life in general, like with, with all of my friends, with my tribe, like if I see a friend who's stuck, who's, who's floundering, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll offer, I'll offer to support them in a second, you know, and I, I don't care about getting paid for that. Like, this is my friend. Uh-huh. I, I want to see them. It sometimes it does turn into them becoming my client, but I, I want to always be able to support my friends when they're stuck. Uh-huh. This even happened last night. A bunch of us were hanging out and one of them, one of, one of our friends is talking about like these things in you know getting her business started and it was funny because she was like oh my god she's saying all the things that my ideal client says and i didn't pitch her an offer but at the end we're hugging and i i I hugged her i was like hey if you're open to it i would love to support you turning this big vision you have into what you can do tomorrow so Uh let's have a time to hop on a call and and i'll and i'll help you with this Uh and it's 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 you know, wanting to give those gifts to people and the you know, law of reciprocity. I don't know. I've lost count of how many free sessions I've done for people. And it always comes back around. Uh-huh. So yeah, that's what I've learned from those guys is like being really generous and open-hearted and always there to support. Of course, with boundaries, you know, I got to pay rent. So there, there, there are, times most of the time when i do charge for those services but that then is what gives me the the stability and the space to go oh you like i you you either can't pay or uh like you're my you're like one of my friends and i'm not going to like try and sell you a thing while we're at this party yeah and and being able to just offer them that uh uh-huh. That like I I get so much joy from doing that, and then it makes it makes when I'm actually in a sales situation even easier because I'm coming from the same place. I'm just asking for money at the end. Yeah, yeah. So we talked earlier in this conversation about the waves, um, the highs and lows of this journey, and we've talked about a lot of the highs and we've examined a lot of your successes. Um, We've alluded to some challenges. I would just like to take a moment to discuss what you'd say is one of the biggest challenges you've encountered on your journey, uh, what you learned from it, and how you overcame it, just to kind of give our listeners like an idea on how to overcome those obstacles that are inevitable on our journey, on our hero's yeah. journey. Yeah, so biggest challenge for me in the last few years was uh, – my coaching business floundering. Uh-huh. Um, like I, I, I tried different messaging. I tried different niches. I tried signing up for another program that ended up putting me like $18,000 in the hole with no return on the investment. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, and that was the thing. Was just like nothing was working. Uh-huh. And it actually it, uh, came to another point. I was like, Hey dad, I can't pay my credit card bill. Can you help me? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, and the, the thing the, the, the first block I experienced was, oh, if I go get a side job, then I failed. I'll, I'm, it's embarrassing to go get a side job. The reality was I was too stressed thinking about money to actually be effective. I remember when I was still with the strong coach, uh, there we were trying to figure out because there were things with the business there that that were were weren't working. And I got on the, the call with one of our with our other coach, and he said, "Okay, let's we got to think about like how how I want to make this program like the best for the clients we have now." And I said honestly, I was like, "Dude, I can't think of that. I'm trying to think about how I'm going to pay rent." So I couldn't even be as effective as a coach in that situation, and then I got let go because the business just wasn't at the point where we could have that many employees. And I was like, well, shit, what do I, what do I do here? Uh So I went on indeed 
And I was like, I was just looking for jobs, looking for jobs. And I found there's a coffee shop I really like in town that were hi- was hiring an assistant baker position. Uh-huh. And I was like, yeah, fuck it. Let's try that. Let's go be a baker. Um, and I ended up, I got, I had the job there and I was also working at stretch lab, which I don't know if you're familiar with that. No, it's like, no. basically people just come in, they lie on a bench and you, you stretch them. Okay. And people pay money for that. I was, I was surprised, but there's, there's a, there's a, a market for that. So I was working those two jobs and, you know, when, when I got, there was a part of me that what I remember actually a buddy, he was like, oh yeah, you want to go do this? This time I was like, ah, I can't, I'm working. And he said, well, you don't have to be embarrassed about it. And I was like, oh shit. Like I was that easy to read <laughs> that, I, that I'm embarrassed about. Cause I, remember, I was like washing dishes and like, fuck, I've got friends making their Broadway debut right now. And here am I, here I am washing dishes. Shit. Um, and that, that was all to give me the stability that I needed in this, this, the financial space where I knew my rent was paid. I knew I could buy groceries. And when I knew that was covered, it was a lot easier for me to, uh, to work on building the business back up. Uh-huh. And the cool thing, you know, still being open to possibilities, while I was working at the coffee shop, my manager said a couple things where I was like, hey, I can help you with that. And he didn't end up signing up, but he almost did. And it was like situations like that where like I put myself in this situation, met an entirely new subset of people. And here it is. I, could, I almost signed a client right there. So then I, I was like, okay, this is, I'm going to stay open to possibilities here. Yeah. And I honestly, it was cool actually like working in the coffee shop. I, my shift started at two in the morning making bagels and muffins and shit. And I had genuine pride in my work. When someone said, hey, Ben, the pastries look great today. I was like, thank you. They do. God damn it. I worked hard on those. Um, and also, I, the, the only, honestly, the reason I quit that job was I, that that schedule wasn't sustainable for me anymore. But the, the thing that kept me in, like, still driving to coaching was there, there were, uh, I guess, three things. Is one recognizing that the the ones who succeed are the ones who keep going. So I knew all I had to do was keep going. Uh. Uh, there was another, there was a moment because my, my, my girlfriend and I were talking about the challenges and of course me like flailing around. She didn't feel very secure with that either. Rightly so. And she, she said, well, like, maybe this just isn't the thing for you and you need to look for something else. And I said, you know, I hear that. And if it gets to the point where that is the answer, I'll do it because that's what needs to be done. But it hasn't been hard for long enough yet. You know, I'm in that oomph phase, you know, I, I'm still grinding on this thing. And yeah, it hasn't got to that point where I, it's too hard for me. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I, and then the last, the thing that, that, I always carry through, I still carry it through into all of my coaching is if you play baseball and through your entire career, you get on base one out of every three times, you're a hall of famer. <laughs> like that, that's the thing is you <laughs> only amazing. have to, yeah, you true. only have to hit a, a single, even a single, just get to first base. If you do that one out of every three times in your baseball career, you're a hall of famer. It's the same thing. You don't have to hit it. Like that's, I think what people struggle with, with content is you, you like, oh, it, it's not viral. I, I failed. You only have to hit singles and doubles to win the game. And uh, yeah, if you only do that one out of every three times, you're going to crush it. Yeah. Like I, I hit, I've hit multiple 10 K months now where my closing percentage is roughly 33%. And that's, that is getting a lot of no's, a lot of no's, but it's worth it for that small subset of yeses. It's a lot of yeses, 33%. That's a lot of yeses. I'm, I'm damn proud of that closing rate. Got to say, I'm, I'm really, I'm really happy about that. Um, uh-huh. But that, and that's then even why I, like I, 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 
made the, the thing to my friends, like if you texted 60 people and I would pay you $3,000, would you do it? Because like people have this resistance, you know, to reaching out and doing DMs. And I did that after the, the Alex Ramosi did this big book launch and he's talking about, yeah, if you've got contacts in your phone, you've got leads. And I was feeling really inspired and motivated. So I sat down and I texted 60 people that day. Yeah. And a week later, one of them signed up and paid me $3,000. Uh-huh. Totally worth the time I spent texting those 60 people. So yeah. that's why I was like, if I paid you $3,000 right now, would you go text 60 people? Uh-huh. And like, that's the thing is like one out of 60 people signed on with me. And it made the whole thing worth it. All of that effort, worth it. All of the uh-huh. no's, worth it. One person. That's all it took. So, like, you again, you, you, you win the game by hitting singles and doubles. The Grand Slam is nice. You know, that's a great highlight real thing. But uh-huh. if you're relying on that, because that even happened to me, is I had a, a bunch of posts that went viral this year. When it was there was a period of a couple of months where consistently I could count on one of my posts would get like 15,000 views and a whole bunch of followers and all these conversations I could start. Uh-huh. And then something shifted in the algorithm, what people like, and my posts stopped doing that. And the number of conversations I was starting went down, the number of leads, the sales calls in August, I had no new, no sales in August because of that. Because it was relying on just hitting this grand slam with one of my posts. And then suddenly the grand yeah. slam's not there. Well, shit, what do I do? Uh-huh. So yeah, it's, it's, it's the one out of every three times hitting a single. That is what it gets you through it. And that's, then that's what I did is I, I, I hired uh, a coach who's a good friend of mine who I knew his, his shit worked and I knew his brain worked differently than mine and like the puzzle pieces fit together. And I sat down, I was like, okay, I'm going to start 20 conversations a day, come hell or high water. I don't care what I have to do. I'm starting 20 conversations a day. And that built up into my goal for the end of the year was 16 clients. And I hit that in June. Uh And that was from applying myself and winning one out of every three times. Mm -hmm. That's all Incredible. Um, I have a final few questions that I ask every guest and we come to that point and they're all pretty meaningful questions and uh, starting off with this one. So through it all, through all, all the highs and lows that is this hero's journey, what has been the greatest life lesson that you've learned on the path thus far? Wow. Love that question. You know, it's, it comes back to my motto. It's on the water bottle fun is the point uh-huh. you know we get so in, I, I i see this happen all the time like i go to a men's retreat and you know there's that the, he has that big break I'm like oh my god i see it now the veil is lifted and every time there's a bunch of guys who go oh, i need to play more uh-huh. and then they don't know how uh-huh. because they've been working so much uh-huh. and if if like, you know, if you're distracted in your business and you keep hopping around from thing to thing, you're looking for novelty. Uh-huh. And if you try and make that from your business, it's gonna, it's gonna bite you uh-huh. because you need to do the boring shit in your business. So have fun elsewhere in your life. You know, play, play is fun is not a, a, a frivolous, nice to have thing. Fun is a vital piece of being human. Play is a integral part of animal development, not just humans, animal development. You know, there's so many men who actually, this is the, the, uh, there was a survey of death row inmates. Okay. The majority of them weren't played with when they were kids. And they're on death row now. Uh So that's the thing is, is if you're in, if you're feeling this, you know, like, ah, just like nothing's working. I I keep working so hard, but then I'm like jumping around from different thing to thing. And like, life's not fulfilling anymore. What's going on. Go have fun, have some fun with your life because that's why you're here in the first place. 
Heck you're not yeah. here to work. You're here to enjoy the human experience. So go have it. Yep. Absolutely. Well said. That's a great lesson. In three words, how would you describe the experience you are having on this earth? So they could be three separate words or a phrase. Yeah, I mean, three words. Fun, for sure. I'm having a fucking blast with my life. Uh, curiosity. A very curious person. And tribe. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm surrounded by a tribe of like-minded people right now where I know that if I'm challenged with something, I can hit up any one of them and they will come right to my side. And uh -huh. I'll do the same thing for them. And having that support is huge. Okay. For those listening, hearing that word tribe and wanting that, but not having that tribe, where does one begin? If, if you really want it and no one else is taking the initiative, you need to be the one to take the initiative to form the tribe. And that is as simple as, hey, I'm having a game night. On, on Thursday, you know, potluck, everyone bring a, bring an appetizer and we'll play some games. That's how we started is like no, of all the friends we have now, a lot of them did not know each other, uh -huh. but we knew them, my girlfriend uh -huh. and I, and we invited them all over for a game night. And that turned into like, now we're like hiking mountains together. We're all going to a festival next weekend together. Uh, we've even, we've started a, uh, our own uh, like entrepreneur mastermind group within our friend group uh, and it's all naturally evolved from, Hey, come over. We're going to play some games. I love it. Again, I love it. Everyone's waiting for you. Yeah. That's the thing is, is if you want something, you can't just, you're not going to get it sitting there twiddling your thumbs, feeling sorry for yourself and saying, Oh, I'm too scared to put myself out there because I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so I don't quite need to be the one takes initiative. Final question. We've played around with time. We've examined your past. We've examined your present and we're going to time travel to the future. We're time to ever travel to the future. And if my math is correct, the year is 2077. So you're 85 years old. This is five years after your 80th birthday where you climbed to the nose of El Capitan. Who is this 85-year-old Ben Walker? Where are you? Who are you surrounded by? What is the legacy that you've left here in your 85 years? And what is the predominant feeling in your being? Oh, my God. I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to cry when I answer this. This is amazing. Um, so... You know what? What I think about, what comes to mind is that this, we haven't talked about this, is I've thought about uh, how I want to die. Because I think that the thing is people talk, well, how do you want to live? Is like, death's not a negation. Death is going to happen. How do you want it to happen? And I imagine myself lying in bed, surrounded by friends, family, I want the grandkids up front and the great grandkids because I want to show them how it's done. Uh -huh. And I'm going to look at every single person and I'm going to say, thank you so much. I love you all. I remember you. And then last breath. That's how I wanted mm -hmm. to go down. I'll be 120, but that's uh -huh. what came to mind when, uh, when you said that. And the predominant feeling as you take that last breath. Peace. Total peace, acceptance, joy even. Uh -huh, that, uh -huh. that I get to share this moment with everyone that I care about. Uh -huh. I just want you to stay in that, in that feeling one moment longer. And we're all magicians and I'm going to play around with time. It's just only an illusion. And I'm going to bring us back to the present. But that 85-year-old or that 125-year-old Ben Walker, right before he takes that last breath, 
he sends you a message. What does he whisper in your ear? You did it, and I believed in you the whole time. <laughs> you did it. You're doing it. This is it. Thank you, Ben. It's been such a pleasure and honor to reconnect um, and have this conversation. For those curious to connect with you and work with you, they can find you on Instagram at Ben Joy Walker. Anyone, anywhere else I can send them? I know Ben, ben Joy Walker is the thing. And if you're in Bend, uh, hit me a message and let's go rock climbing. Heck yeah. To close every episode, we bring our fist in together for a digital fist bump, a choice, a step into the winner circle. Boom. Yeah. Thank you, brother. My, my pleasure, Derek. This is a great podcast. I'm, I'm really, really, uh, yeah, I'm going to stop saying words because they're not going to do it justice. Uh-huh. <laughs> Much love, much appreciation, and uh, we'll see you all soon.